Hello there, and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 351. That's tres cinco uno. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. How am I? You know, mas o menos, I'm getting there little by little. Thanks so much for joining me. As always, if you're watching this via the YouTube, make sure you smash that like, hit subscribe, and of course, leave me a comment down below if you're listening via the podcast app leave me a five-star review and share the show with your friends and if you want to continue supporting the show and get access to the full audio library as well as the full audio podcast of the episode you're currently watching in the future but you want to get it two days before then sign up to my patreon for as little as one dollar a month you can get access to my entire library as well as the full audio podcast before anybody else on patreon so go to my patreon as patreon.com for slash agostino a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o sign up to my patreon down below Below. the link is in the descriptions and in the pinned comments so here we are once again um i've been getting all my zen my zen vibe right i've been trying to get a bit um, um calm and trying to become still in this crazy times we're living in and i happened to uh pick up or happened to um come across this book that i bought a long time ago in my library which is the wisdoms of the buddha as you can see here all right um, some very poignant bits in here and pieces, very poignant little um, quotes and mantras on various things such as, you know, um, topics as the fall. I'll give you an example here. Let's pick a number one. It says here, number 68 on the fall, it says, no, that deed is well done of which a man does not repent and the reward of which he receives gladly and cheerfully. Then we've got the wise man, a random one. We've got as solid as a rock is not shaken by the wind. Wise people falter, not amiss blame and praise. Oh, I like that one. Uh, let's pick another one that's good. Good topic. Let's go for evil. Let's say this one, number one, one, eight on evil. It says, if a man does what is good, let him do it again. Let him delight in it. Happiness is the outcome of good. Gotta love that one. And then lastly, we'll go to old age. Because what? No, let's go to this one, actually. The world. It says on the world, which is number 169, it says here, follow the law of virtue, do not follow the sin and the virtuous rest in bliss in this world and in the next. I love that, right? So it kind of reminds me of something Jordan Peterson would have said a long time ago when he was fit and able to do talks and conferences and stuff. Kind of miss that guy, man. Hope he gets back on stage very soon. I know he's got a bit of a bad rep lately. It seems like it's kind of cool to hate Jordan Peterson, but at the time that he came about, I think a lot of men like myself were very um, impacted by the words he had to say and we were able just to pluck, just to kind of extract his value, extract the good things from what he was saying and kind of do away with all the, you know, needless wars with the SJWs and stuff. We didn't really care about that and some of the campus debates and politics, which obviously have seeped into our everyday life but i think by and large this idea that you should be accountable that you should be uh dependable that i think he even says sometimes in interviews where he uses the kind of um he frames it in the way of like oh if god forbid somebody in your family passes away right a close member of your family that you should be the rock within your family as a young man right you should be the person that's sort of holding your family together whilst everybody is stricken with grief you should be the one everyone can depend on to get things sorted and i thought that was really um that really hit home right this idea that you should kind of be um you should be more important you should be you should be of service to the people around you and less worried about how you are kind of managing the situation and kind of deal with your stuff later right it's sort of a really grown-up way of looking at how to deal with problems especially in this way in this world where everyone's been infantilized and people be get molly coddled and they get told oh everything's gonna be all right you know they get pampered they get told to sit on someone's lap but, you know um, they get given a lollipop even though they finished 10th all this nonsense right that's not the way to go so i did really appreciate jordan pearson's contribution in the short time that he was around and i'm still hoping once he recovers and gets well i remember seeing the interview actually where he mentioned that he's recovering and he's kind of on the mend at the moment so it would be great to hear him speak about what's going on at the moment in society and culture and maybe give us a little bit maybe give us some great sound bites actually because he was always good for that in it so yeah man i'm reading the wisdom of the buddha and it's also making me think about the role religion has to play in this world at the moment i think we are a pretty 
anti maybe it's kind of an, a reaction to what's happening with all these me too cancellations and stuff we're quite sexless in it in a way right there's kind of a bit of a re revulsion against you know if i don't know if it's revulsion but there's sort of a it feels like don't get me wrong if you get accused of a heinous crime you're in the wrong right but there is something ambiguously hot and ambiguously um attractive about the courtship process right or the courtship dance right there's something that you can't really put your finger on right about why that person's into you or why you're into them or why it's okay for you to make a move or why it isn't okay to make a move at this point it's something that you just can't kind of equate in the normal senses of like you know getting a bit of paper like you did back in the day in school and right and having their name and having would you go out with me yes or no i remember doing that a couple of times absolutely getting all the no's of course back in the day but bloody hell how embarrassing but it's not as simple as that right um relationships especially between two people who are really into each other or who are undecided can be really weird and clumsy right but sometimes that's what brings out the best in it or in both situations or the best in people so to kind of get into this point where we're sort of reducing ourselves to having to ask for permission to make moves we have devoid of religion too which is also hurting us i think in that regard right that we don't believe in a person higher than ourselves or than the being higher than ourselves we don't believe in a higher power we don't we have this weird obsession with trying to um trying to i don't know steer every part of our lives and have some sort of influence in everything that we do when really most of it is just randomness right and some of it is predetermined um but we have this weird it's like kind of like my uh, i always have a bit of a i always kind of hated when that whole um uh what do you call it hacking was it called hacking what was it called that thing in um startup culture where everyone was trying to optimize personal performance right they'll mix in they'll put in slabs of butter in their coffee they were taking these weird tablets so that they could just keep working and working for what right? especially now considering what's happening in the world now right all those guys are were obsessed with trying to t you know squeeze every minute of the day every hour of the week now what's that going on right now what now you're probably thinking you know <laughs> you'd probably like nothing more than to wall away and waste your time doing something a bit brainless especially if you've been locked indoors quarantining properly it's a very strange time i do think maybe there's going to be a renaissance in religion it feels like there is a little bit of a movement with some of the trads out there right the traditionalists that are sort of like harking back to this golden era i don't know when that golden era was maybe maybe it was when i was on the fields right picking stuff my ancestors i don't know what golden era they're talking about but it seems like we're sort of um slowly but surely getting back to that point where we start to think you know what maybe this isn't what it's all cracked up to be maybe we shouldn't be as materialistic as we are at the moment maybe we shouldn't be so obsessed with even celebrities have you have you noticed that i think lockdown has been the worst thing to happen to a celebrity ever apart from maybe when the writer strike happened i think in hollywood a lot of shows got cancelled a lot of shows went that's kind of one of the um one of the casualties of the writer strike was the simpsons right i think the simpsons suffered a lot through that i think maybe a couple of deaths as well i'm not too sure but i remember the simpsons maybe futurama a couple of those shows went to absolute shit because of the writer strike but i think the pandemic has been the worst thing to happen to hollywood in forever right because effectively what it did is that it exposed these celebrities or these kind of icons as they kind of build them for exactly what they are in it they just paid puppets but for some reason the media and maybe ourselves we tried to convince ourselves that they were more than the sum they were more than what they actually did on the screen they were like a far more interesting person they had layers they were relatable they could be like our they could be our friend all this sort of bullshit right but in reality they're multi-millionaire narcissistic actors who have essentially been able to beat the odds right because i just imagine what a because i always think about it, it always makes me giggle whenever i see someone like a margot ruby right a really attractive woman on the screen i always think to myself imagine what a audition waiting room um where margot ruby is trying to get a role in a film must look like where they all look like it because they you know they're gonna if they're gonna put a casting call out they're gonna want a blonde of a particular height of a particular waist size whatever a particular accent i don't know what you can do whatever i right? just imagine the waiting room full of blondes waiting to get that shot at that movie and it's only one of you's gonna get that role just imagine how weird that must what that must do to your head knowing that you're going to go up against someone like a Margot Ruby like oh damn it Jamie you know, you're in a wait you might as well just go home as soon as you see in the waiting room you might as well just like put the pen on the table and just walk or do you just go in there and sit next to him and be like nah I'm going to do this right I'm going to show you it's like a little psychological play when you know for what you're not going to get the job so imagine that person right beating those odds 
which is really difficult regardless how attractive you are there's, any, there's you know attractive people in hollywood are 10 a penny you beat those odds you finally make it to the top of the mountain and now every everybody is like you know literally sucking you off for lack of a better term it's no surprise that you're going to be a little bit you know um you're going to be a little bit uh out of touch right you're going to be a little bit um a little bit no out, yeah out of touch is the best phrase to use about it right like it's at that it's at that um video that ellen made that sort of like caused the whole shit storm at the beginning of the pandemic when she was complaining about dra going crazy in her you know 50 acre i don't know whatever many square foot mansion that she has in the hill somewhere right everyone's like what how can you be telling us that and smiling and giggling as if you like you relate to us we're not, not the same right living in a dingy apartment somewhere in the middle of brooklyn you know with cockroaches all around the place whilst you're watching her complain about her mansion you're like nah you know what i mean i'm gonna turn this off so pandemic has been such a horrible time for those people um but it's also probably made us realize that hey we need we need um we need more in our lives than just this brainless stimulus stimuli that we get from social that we get from videos that we get from you know these new era films that are just devoid of any kind of depth any texture any um any, anything memorable right what's the, what's the last movie you watched post 2010 that you actually remember like legit remember in your head oh yeah i remember what happened here it's just you just you might remember the plot line loosely but do you actually remember the movie like you remembered goodfellas right that you like you remembered i don't know mean street like you know like you remembered snap i don't know snatch whatever they're not they, they don't exist anymore and maybe that's part of it right if you don't have religion and you're sexless you're sexless in that regard it might it must be really difficult to create hot art yeah, it might, might be difficult to create high out on that level. It must be. Like when you're just getting all your references from fucking Twitter memes and, you know, um, forums and stuff. It's just like that isn't the way that you create high art, right? You create high art by living, by going through experiences, by bumping into some crazed lunatic in the middle of a bar somewhere and realizing, oh, shit, that's Gene Simmons, right? That's that's how you actually create high art. You don't create high art by, by you know, arguing with randoms on Twitter. That's not how it goes, in my opinion, anyway. But again what do i know anyway we've got an action-packed show here ready for you loads of stuff to talk about loads of stuff to get into loads of things i've seen on the internet and stuff concerning culture that i want to comment on of course you know the standard vibes you know the vibes you know the player you know how it is so first things first of course force and prayers go out to everyone living in Le beirut lebanon like you know a massive explosion happened on the port we're not really sure what exactly caused the explosion whether it's a fireworks factory whether it was a bomb whether it was uh, something else whatever happened it caused unprecedented amount of damage right just incredibly like incredibly vicious in its um impacts and the loss of life is going to be you know extreme to say the least i think we all aware of that but but just seeing the videos from all the different angles of how you know um i guess i guess because you're so used to seeing things blow up in movies you sort of think they don't do that in real life but i guess in some movies they probably do go out there and hire the best i don't know bomb disposal experts or you know bomb effects experts or something like that right to kind of give them an idea as how bombs actually um detonate in the real world and when you see it you're like whoa like it kind of hits you harder because you know it's real and also the impact of it like jesus christ man um i'm not too sure what the sonic boom thing the second mushroom cloud will happen because the initial cloud is sort of like a regular fire then it seems like whatever fireworks or propellant or whatever i don't know paint or powder whatever colored powder that was in that factory sort of made the flames turn a weird uh burgundy red and then you start seeing a lot of flashes and sparks which made you think okay there's some fireworks there and then suddenly it blew up again and there was this weird sort of like boom like sonic boom sort of thing similar to what you would have seen on a concord um i think that was one of the reasons why concord didn't actually um go off right it didn't actually go become as successful as it could have mostly due to the noise complaints i remember watching a video about it a little documentary where they said the noise complaints were from residents because it's really loud and also the fact that when it hits a certain speed in the air it goes you know it goes for a sonic boom and it makes you know a sonic boom a really loud noise that you can it's audible from a, a far distance so you can imagine what that must be like in it but yeah this is vicious man i think i've actually got a video up here i'm going to show you of different angles of the actual bomb going off <laughs> 
that is just insane, insane. Just imagine how scary that must be, actually living right next to that and seeing it. And then also just think to about it yourself, right? That, you know, everyone lives in an area where there might be a fire, you know, there might be a fight or there might be a, you know, a whole stream of police cars hurtling down the street near you and you might record it, but you don't ever think that what you're recording is going to turn into something like this, right? You're just thinking, oh, it's just a fire, you know what I mean, in the building, but you don't think it's going to turn into a global event that impacts, you know, numerous amounts of families and takes, you know, hundreds of lives, I think, so far, I've read. Bloody hell. Jesus Christ. That is insane. Insane. Yeah, you see. I'm good, I'm good. That is crazy, man. Absolutely crazy. And again, um, Force and prayers go out to everybody that was impacted and hopefully, you know, the casualties are not as large as everyone's assuming, but judging by what you've read online so far, you can only guess it's going to be in the hundreds, man, if not, you know, yeah, it's just mad. It's just mad, man. Mad, 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 mad. Next thing to talk about. This was quite hilarious. Um, so I guess Trump sat down with what Axios um, for an interview. Um and he, you know, I think usually whenever the the Trump thing's weird in it because it gets a, it's a bit boring talking about Trump in it because you know everyone knows you know so it's like talking about Boris Johnson here in the UK it gets a bit boring. We know it's a bit of an oof, or um, or a doof as they say in America. We know that right. So the best way to enact any kind of change is to get him out of office, right? You just kind of vote for whoever you want to replace him. Or you do your best to, you know, contribute to society and to local policy any way you can to make the change. But, you know, ranting, raving about on Twitter, it's just, you know, it's it's moot and it's a bit of a wasted exercise. But it is funny to sort of look at him as just an entity to kind of just like look at and be like, just to kind of observe from afar and be like, wow, you actually made it. You actually achieved your goal and became president of the United States against all the odds. And every time we think you can't say something more insane you always kind of had to do yourself right so on one side you got him interviewing you you got him sitting down with uh dave portnoy from barstool sports for a fairly entertaining interview i thought he was really funny in that interview uh oddly enough i think he came across pretty human um for whatever you hear about him especially when you read books about him you always kind of assume everything that you read in a book about trump from somebody that doesn't like him always confirms the stuff that you already see right about how he acts, about how, um, you know, <laughs> about how he doesn't like to read and stuff. Like all these things that you read in books, you would kind of get confirmed when you actually see him talk and communicate with others. But I thought the Barcelona Sports interview did a good job because they, you know, Dave did a good job in kind of humanizing him in a way, right? He kind of made some jokes about him regretting sending out tweets and stuff. And, you know, he came across all right, don't get me wrong. Um, but this interview was interesting because he got to sit down with an actual journalist, like one of those kind of BBC, you know, Jeremy Paxman type ones, right? That actually is going to put pressure on you, ask you some, um, you know, some very, uh, uh, some very probing questions, questions that you can't get away with just, you know, doing that whole um, political fluff speak where you don't say nothing, you don't say yes on, if someone asks you, and they, there's, like a, there's a tactic they always do, right? Whenever an interview asks them a yes or no question, they always sort of, Mm, skirt around it right they always kind of answer in general right they kind of lay both they lay both sides of the argument down and don't say anything at the end these sort of journalists will never let you get away with that so hearing trump trying to navigate that interview um and still try and do that thing where he kind of repeats things in the hope that the person will kind of just move on it's funny and also the bit where he kind of says hey you can't do that like as if like he's like a child right like when, whenever somebody pushes back at his argument or questions his point of view or basically says what you're talking what you're saying is you know complete crap he's like hey you can't do that it's really really funny i'll play a little bit of it if you now <laughs> to watch but it's hilarious man it really is uh i believe you now I'd love to. We're gonna look. Let's look. And if you look at death, yeah, curve, started to go up again. One. Well, right here, the United States is lowest in. It's lowest. His voice is honestly. It's just he just even sounds dumb. That, if that even is that even a thing? Can you even say that out loud? 
It even sounds dumb, isn't it? Uh, so, and imagine, right? United States, by all accounts, has failed completely with the coronavirus, right? They've, they've sort of not taken any lessons for anything that's happened in Southeast Asia or in Europe. They've just gone about it in their own way. Every state's got their own way of dealing with it. And collectively, they've done a terrible job. But still, you know, your, your, um, what you call it? Your citizens are dying, mate. Do you know what I mean? There's a pandemic that's sweeping the entire nation of North America. And, you know, there's people that still don't believe it's a thing. They think it's a hoax. They're on the fence. They are making, you know, they believe in conspiracy theories. They are believing in alternative scientists, whatever it may be, right? There's not a unified message or unified approach to dealing with it. And then, you know, in the face of that, you're bringing up, you're, you're taking papers with you with graphs and stuff and lines to prove your point. It's like, Mad guy. Numerous categories uh, were lower than the world. Lower than the lower world. Than <laughs> in what? Look, in what? Take a look. Right here. Here's case death. Oh, you're doing death as a proportion of cases. I'm talking about death as a proportion of population. That's where the US is really bad. It's even a weird stat to even do, isn't it? Why would you why would you have papers? with a stat that says death by cases and not death by population. I guess because you want to fub the numbers because that's essentially what's happening, but it's a weird thing to even kind of pin your hat on really because it's easily debunked. Well, much worse than South Korea, Germany, etc. You can't, you can't do that. You have to, you have to go by... You, you can't do that. Go Let's go back again, okay, I'm sorry. I'm talking about death as a proportion of population. That's where the US is really bad. <laughs> Well, much worse than South Korea, <laughs> Germany, etc. You can't, you can't do that. You have, <laughs> to, you have to go by. Oh, he's a legend. He's an absolute we're legend. We're I swear, he really is a legend. States. You have to go by the cases. The cases. Why not? As a proportion when of population. When you have somebody, what it says is when you have somebody that yeah. has where there's a case. Oh, okay. The people that live sure. from oh. those cases. It's surely a relevant statistic to say if the U.S. has X population and X percentage of death of that population no, versus because you South have Korea. No, to go by the cases. Well, look at South Korea, if, for example. 51 million population, 300 deaths. It's like, it's you, crazy you compared to know that. I do, it's you on the... Don't know that. You think they're faking their statistics, uh, South Korea? I, I, I won't get into country? that because they have a very good relationship yeah. with the country, but you don't know that. And He's the best. He really is the best, man. It's just insane to believe that somebody like that has made it as president. But it's also interesting to think that there's people out there that will watch that because that, that's the thing that's interesting about living nowadays, right? Especially with the pandemic. There's just so many different points of view about something that's quite clearly... Um, I would say clearly, kind of to, to this, quite clear, quite easy to understand. It's not easy to understand because you know we haven't figured out a vaccine. But it's interesting to think that there's so many people who have so many different views and opinions about what's actually happening with the pandemic and how we're dealing with it, what the right approach is to kind of eradicate it and for us to get back to normal, quote unquote. It's interesting that I think just that fact that you know line up ten different people random people and they're all going to give you a different interpretation of what the issue is and what's to blame and how to deal with it and there's no unified approach no one's sort of like all blanketly agreeing about wearing masks we're not all blankly agreeing about you know physically distancing we don't all blankly agree that you know we should stay indoors or you know avoid crowded places everyone's got a different idea about what how bad it is um and how to deal with it and also there's people out there who legit will look at that interview and think oh he's been stuck up oh he's been you know dead they're trying to make him look dumber than what he is. Oh, it's the MSN media, right? The fake news. Da, 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 da. It's like, no, you, objectively, you can't look at that as a fan of it and say, that's a bit of a car crash interview, really, isn't it? He came into there woefully unprepared. He looked like he just, even those printouts, he looked like he didn't really know anything about those printouts prior to handing them to the actual interviewee. He wasn't really speaking with any kind of conviction, right? He's sort of like, you know, when you've, you, you know, when you're in a group in class and you have to contribute something, but then you don't really want to contribute anything and you have to, and then you forget you have to present it and then you have to kind of fluff you have to kind of then present your part as if like you did the work but you know you didn't do the work and you're kind of reading the screen as you're talking but you're actually reading reading it because you don't know what the screen says that's what he's sort of doing he didn't do the homework innit? oh what a psychopath man really is <coughs> and then this other thing because <laughs> i think i mentioned it before previous on the show that i'm a big fan of um watching videos of uh, uh watching pe videos of people falling over basically right on the internet and i found an absolute gem of one of those videos right one someone that actually really tickled my belly and um it's a video that's interesting because it shows this um rather large lady 
trying attempting to jump off of a looks like a little cliff into crystal blue clear crystal blue um water right so amazing venue amazing place wherever she is looks like a great time but it's interesting because in the context of this video it, you only understand it once you've tried once you've attempted to dive from a high place into water you know how scary that is and also i remember for the longest time i never knew you know jumping into the water you know belly flopping into it or on your back is gonna actually you know could essentially fuck you up um considering you know depending on how high you jump and how you enter the water you could hit it like a like a sack of bricks um on a concrete floor right it could really mess you so seeing this video and then knowing that and knowing how much it hurt me when i kind of didn't land in the water the right way i winced completely but it's super hilarious the way she sort of runs into it i'm gonna play it for you now <laughs> this is it she kind of runs and then just smashes her face head into it now i don't know if it's because she didn't know that there was going to be like a little cliff edge or that because it's a weird sort of thing right it looks I guess from the, from where she is, the water looks um, further down than what it actually is. And then maybe she f also thought the little bit, the little <laughs> hillside bit was further out too that she could run against. But the running in the air bit is what really got me. She's running in the air. Look at that. She's running in the air. Legitly running in the air. Oh, that looked like it hurt, man. She looks okay though. She looks like she recovered. That is insane. That is legit insane. I don't know how people could do that. I really don't. Don't do that to yourself, man. <laughs> oh gosh, almighty. What can you do? What can you do? <laughs> okay, what's the next one? Oh yeah, we got some absolute gems right um it looks like my fellow british citizens have um gone abroad and really made good examples of themselves to the international uh community they've shown that you know we're dealing with covid the right way we are not taking any chances we're keep we're staying in place we're avoiding people we're wearing our masks and that sort of good stuff right that's what they're doing wrong they're not a group of lads, I guess, on their way to a holiday in Ibiza, which I don't really get what people are doing now. There's a few people online some YouTubers I know or some YouTubers I follow who um, some bodybuilders and stuff who are maybe deciding to go to Ibiza so they can train and they can, you know, be in the sun. Um, they can have access to, you know, great settings to film their videos and vlogs. It's probably a little bit cheaper to live in Ibiza temporarily um, than it might be to be in Dubai or something, especially if you've not been sponsored. But all in all, from what I've seen on videos, everything is shut. All the restaurants have got, you know, really naff performers trying to keep you entertained. And generally, it's not the vibe that it once was. So it's a bit of a waste of holiday to go there, unless you're obviously going there to kind of reconnect with the old Ibiza, right? The actual, um, the Ibiza that actually, uh, that basically created the legend, right? The one where you go into the hidden mountains, you go into some weird enclave, you meet this weird collective of people who do yoga and suck each other off, you know, all these sort of madnesses. But usually everyone's going to basically rave and you know pick up shitty mdma so this video is from i guess it's been spreading across um youtube it's from some some guys were on a flight for on kaelin flight and they got into some fight i don't know why but this is an article here from the tribune the indian tribune it says passengers exchange blows on board uh klm aircraft over wearing masks okay this is an interesting one imagine getting into a fight proper fisty cuff because someone's not wearing a fight that screen cap here is amazing the guy looking there shocked someone with a bloody nose someone with a mask half down his face and it's just a, a, an absolute cacophony of uh, you know of absolute neanderthals it says yeah clash between two passengers on board an aircraft over wearing a face mask has gone viral on social media but both put behind bars the violent uh fight broke out on the klm flight from amsterdam to ibiza after the two men refused to wear a mask imagine that all the lads going to amsterdam to go smoke some doobies you know hang out go social distance with some prozies and then picking up you know and then going or oh, picking up exactly and then heading off to ibiza to go get a bit of a tan and see if they can pick up some you know i don't know some abuelas i don't know whatever but this video is jokes man fighting on a plane must be so hard just imagine how that must be like actually fighting like with somebody that you don't like with an op for instance right how hard that must be to get blows in to kind of avoid getting punched to avoid hitting somebody else that you don't mean to hit it's definitely and you definitely can't do that thing where you can the only way you can not be involved or do that kind of that famous kind of what's her name Gemma Collins 
I'm not involved. I'm not getting involved, right? You can't do that unless you've got a window seat. If you've got an aisle seat, you're messed. Look at them. Look at that bloody nose getting punched in the face. He's getting dragged. Getting pushed. Hands. Oof. Blood everywhere. It's funny that the staff still have all their masks on and gloves. <laughs> oh, he's on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what happens with this. If you're mid-flight, do they just have to go to a destination, or do they, or they have to like um, make a detour and land somewhere? I'm assuming they've got some protocol in place where if somebody has a heart attack, they'd have to kind of land somewhere closest, right? I'd imagine, probably. <laughs> that is. Look him. He promise. <laughs> Are they kneeling on his neck? Oh no, I don't know. I don't think so. But he he looks like he's... <laughs> what a holiday, man! <sighs> Absolute gems in it. They are representing Britain proud. <laughs> oh bloody hell, man! Sometimes it's just you know you can take the piss out of America as much as you want, but then you're just reminded about where you come from. You're like, oh god. That hurt to see that in it. Just when you think we're being sensible and we're abiding by the rules. Nope. So, next on the list. Oh, this is a good one. Should DJs accept bookings during pandemic and be held accountable for the rising COVID-19 deaths? This is um, a question taken from Business Techno on um, Twitter, actually, but it made me think because of the events that have been popping up all over the place in Paris and in Mo some some events in Malta, a couple of in Italy, where some DJs have been heading out and playing in countries that have, you know, that have... Um, have a questionable control on uh, on the virus at the moment and um in general probably are painting a bad picture as to what the current state of affairs is globally or europe wide so on the question in terms of should a dj be responsible for the rising covid cases they go and play somewhere and you know yeah of course right if you go and play somewhere and the numbers are one way and then you leave and the numbers spike up and they can tr track and trace it to a certain area that you are playing in with the people that actually attended your event yeah you're bang to rights and the evidence is there there's a paper troll you're obviously going to be responsible for it but i don't think it's fair when the djs are going to countries that have got some kind of control on the situation and who are actively telling promoters to try and put on events so that they can boost tourism and get some money in the bank right because that's what's basically happening a lot of governments are probably too quick to reopen the economy because they didn't really have an adequate plan in place to um support areas different sectors of, of business they didn't really put grants in place they didn't assist anyone it's all kind of left everybody up to their own devices and by the time they tried to figure out something it was too late there were too many businesses that were crumbling or on their knees and you know they can't be expected to give everybody a grant or to bail out every single company so they're having to pick and choose so if they can get some kind of control on it minimize the risk uh bring the number of cases down number of deaths down I don't really think it's a bad thing to try and tell people up different sectors of your industry, especially regarding tourism, whether it's hospitality, whether it's bars and clubs, to say, hey, you can put on an event, make sure it kind of follows this protocol that we kind of know works at the moment. And, you know, whatever it may be, track and trace, uh, social distancing, blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, just so that we can make sure we don't tank as an economy. And, that's the most that they can do. And then, of course, it's up to the promoter as well, because I think there's a lot, there's too much onus put on the DJ. I think as well, it's a, it's a twofold, isn't it? There has to be, yeah, it's twofold. I remember because when I was promoting, I always kind of like to go out of my way to make the DJ, DJs feel comfortable because I'm a DJ myself. I know how it feels to go into a club where you're playing and not see the promoter for like 20 minutes as you arrive, not know what time you're actually going to play because the person before you has kind of gone over time, not have not know if you need to buy your drink tokens and expense it, and not know if you need to buy your drinks and expense it or you're going to get tokens or you're going to have to use the person to go up and get drinks all the time. You know, all that sort of unknowing thing is can be annoying. So... I know when I put on events, I tried to go out my way to make 
the promoters feel comfortable by basically taking away any responsibility from them that they don't need to have. They're only there to play music, right? I've hired you, I booked you because you're a person that I kind of vibe with, that I like, that I'm a big fan of, and I think you're gonna resonate with my crowd. So you come, you play, I pay you, you go home happy, boom, boom, your uncle granny, your aunt. I don't think they should be responsible for flipping, you know, um, influencing policy or advocating for, you know, safer, dan- safer, st- what, uh, safer health standards, whatever. That should be. The the owner should be placed primarily to the promoter's feet and also to the country that he's in right if it's legal quote unquote to do it then do it but i guess with pandemic the interesting or the kind of dubious part of it the weird part of it is that it's more so about a civic duty right it's more so about um morally what does that look like and how what kind of greater good does it serve to have people partying and celebrating and you know dancing around um in a fashion that wouldn't lead you to believe that some somehow it's okay to go out and do that stuff when it isn't at the moment in most places it, apart from you know a select few countries most places haven't returned back to normal at all they've got you know varying levels of normality but normal normal isn't going to be back onto a vaccine but i think we're all kind of aware of that right we know that we've all accepted it i think i've said on this podcast a few times your 2020 is done like don't you know don't get your hopes up about 2020 being re- rescued i remember that we had this big campaign in the uk with the government about oh we want to save your summer save your summer the summer's over it's finished it was over in march right you should just you know bin it whatever you can rectify whatever you can salvage from this situation whether it's going to a trip somewhere you know to you know to the countryside or going to a seaside somewhere in Bournemouth for Hastings whatever maybe you do that and enjoy yourself I don't think you're going to rescue the summer and be able to go to you know um, I don't know uh, Southeast Asia and do back backpacking or go to South America and do your backpack thing that's not going to happen do your you know do, um, put your plans off for next year but yeah I guess a civic person civic responsibility is probably the thing in there so this kind of comes to the point or comes to head because I guess um Amelia Lenz a DJ who's kind of I guess she has an interesting reputation and not reputation she has she has an interesting um the opinion on someone like her is definitely split it feels like within the in the, within the scene in general right me personally i'm not really a fan of her djing skills i think she's pretty mediocre um i think that approach of just playing bangers back to back isn't necessarily for me but also appreciate her position in the scene i also think there's an aspect of her that's more so you know i don't think you become as successful as she has if you're not that attractive right it is what it is it kind of gives you a bit of a boost uh the fact that she's a former model kind of helps her out as well but for the most part she you know she does her job she kind of uses her platform to the best of her ability but she seems to occupy that business techno end of things that isn't necessarily something that i'm very much interested in i think a lot of people are very much del- not deluded but they're a bit naive as to expect somebody like a, a Mady lens a peggy goo a shot the wit these are really big festival stage you know standing next to a porsche nike sponsor djs to have some kind of um you know uh, to have some kind of or not even altruistic to have some kind of um view holistic view about how they view the scene it's not going to happen right for them they've kind of come into it i kind of said it before about maybe a peggy that i always kind of feel like their influence is first dj second right which is not a bad thing i think we have got to a point now in the scene where if you want to be i'd imagine anyone that's got some kind of social media following has a bit of clout on social and they segue into djing they become very successful especially if they commit to it and they get into like record digging they get into producing they actually link up with certain promoters they release stuff on certain labels you could probably get really far because at the end of the day clubs want to sell tickets right like a lump if you're a purist and you can't sell tickets it is what it is isn't it you're not going to get booked in the big places people need to sell tickets to justify paying the rent or to, to basically keep the lights on isn't it so i understand her position in the scene but i'm also kind of not surprised when somebody like an amelia lens is quick to go and play somewhere so the situation at hand is that she went to go play at this party um party promotion or this collective in paris called possession they put on a lot of really cool events all around paris usually around the suburbs it feels like loads of 
um, kind of warehouse spaces, open air events now, because obviously with the pandemic, they do stuff really, um, you know, underground in that respect, no addresses, you have to sign up, it gets text to you or you call a number, you know, kind of reminiscent of the old school rave day. So I really, um, a really cool approach right you can see the people that are actually putting it together are actually fans of the culture they're fans of the music um and they're sort of geeking out and being able to book some of their friends or some of the people they look up to uh to play in their city right and paris as well you, when you think of paris you don't think of techno you don't think of underground music so for paris to have this resurgence is really cool to see all right but i guess if you're a fan of Amelia lens or you're or you're kind of very conscious of what's happening in society you would probably get feel a bit away seeing these videos of Amelia Lenz playing in this kind of, you know, packed place that's open air, don't get me wrong, but people clearly not socially distancing and just having a whale of a time. Now, you could be a bit jealous like I am because I'd obviously love to go and rave again, but there is a part of you that's a bit like, this isn't probably the best way that we should be going about things. This is not probably the best message to be sending out to people actually that, you know, things are back to normal because they clearly aren't. This is a video as well that popped up from my Instagram that I'm going to play for you now if you're just listening. She's playing here in front of a packed audience, it looks like, right? They're really far, they're really close to, to the stage. There's no distancing there. Everyone's got their phones out recording. Some people have masks on, most people don't. And they're just raving in an open air place somewhere that looks bloody beautiful, to be fair, right? This song is dedicated to all the riders in the National Guard. Thank you so Next one. I hate the hands. I hate the hands. I hate all that. I hate it. I, I know you have to be some kind. You have to. There is there is a little bit of performance, a bit of theatre that comes with DJing, right? You got someone like one of my favourites, like a Ricardo Villalobos and stuff, and he's effortlessly caught and always kind of twirling around. But I hate this kind of like. I don't know, man. There's something about it. It's just so cringe, right? But hey, again, if you want to break your current, you want to break your quarantine, or you want to break. A, <laughs> protocol and go and see Amelie play in a you know in an open air event then credit to you but this is not the vibe but hey it looks like fun there's like nothing interesting about what she plays and it's just all the same like it's just like you could just go and beat poor and pick the top 20 hits and just sling them on <laughs> Oh, that sounds good. I like that sound. And what a horrible cr the, the look! The people behind the stage look like they're having more fun than people actually in front of, which is ironic. Which no, which is funny because it's the actually opposite when you see those videos of people playing in like I don't know in Italy somewhere it seems like the people behind the booth are always like bougie and VIP-ish and acting aloof and oh look we're cool because we're standing next to the DJ and the people in the crowd are usually the ones that are going crazy trying to get the attention of people behind the deck so it's an interesting flip people got their mask on their chin or mask over their eyes topless perspirating Ooh, perfect COVID conditions And then, what's, and then what's the other one here? Yeah, it's not for me. You have to be a certain person to be going to. So yeah, she's getting a lot of stick for that, I guess, online. Um, mostly, I guess, again, usually with this cancel stuff, because people don't like her anyway, right? People think that she's undeserving of a spot. She's not talented. She's annoying, blah, blah. I don't know, whatever it is, right? But... The bigger question is that would you do it hmm i guess if you're that it's interesting because there's an interesting argument against it because you know if you're somebody on her level or somebody of that level there's probably an argument to be had that you probably don't need to play again and again we're not counting people's we don't know how people handle their finances you know counting people's pockets is a bit cuck but let's imagine for instance that she's getting paid like i don't know anywhere between 10 to 30 grand per gig or something right or anywhere between 5 to 20 let's be you know, let's be kind of, um, let's dumb down that valuation a little bit. That's a lot. 
right? Most of these people are playing what four times, maybe five times per week, right? Um, in different places, um, you know, traveling the world mostly, sometimes Europe, most of well, most of Europe, and sometimes the world. That's a lot of coin you're picking up. You're easily if you're if you're doing a really if you're kind of um, promoting an EP or you're on tour, you could probably clear a hundred grand in a month, like pretty easily right um this is without you know agent fees and all that sort of stuff and booking managers but you could easily clear 100 grand so to imagine that these people are number one either so desperate to play that they'll just go and do it regardless of how much money they have in the bank because they don't need to actually leave their home right i guess that's the argument we have at the moment with a lot of people who uh, have the privilege of being able to work from home because they have a job that allows you to do so most people you know some people i guess the large majority of the workforce have to be out there stacking our shelves delivering our mail delivering our amazon packages they can't work from home right doesn't you know their job doesn't allow them to do so but if you have the ability to work from home you should probably be doing it right and trying your best to mitigate you spreading um the virus especially you know because a lot of people say oh you feel all right if you get tested best yeah you get tested but there's no um there's no telling who you might pass it on to during the time that you have it, especially if you break quarantine so there's an argument to be had that she shouldn't be going because she has a lot of money in the bank and you know you should be able to stay at home and just go out when the time is warranted right and um, but then on the other hand of it who are we to tell somebody who's essentially devoted their entire life to pursuing this goal of becoming a professional DJ, a touring DJ, somebody that people want to see, which isn't, which isn't easy, right? I think people need to kind of get that through their heads. Like becoming a successful DJ is really difficult. Trust me, I'm still trying to do so, right? Um, and the issue is that, of course, I always say that I think DJing is probably the, the lowest con the, the lowest bar of entry in the kind of music world i guess performing wise apart from maybe hitting a, a, a triangle or banging on a tambourine it's the easiest thing to kind of do and to learn how to get better or it's the easiest thing to do and it's also the easiest thing to master i guess in a short period of time so there's just too many djs out there with not enough gigs to go around so for you to beat the odds and become successful especially as a female now don't get me wrong she's a you know former model um that obviously helps because it feels like there's a certain segment of that business techno that just is all about the looks when it comes to ladies it's just no coincidence that all the most of the business techno ladies happen to be fairly attractive it there's no coincidence right like objectively it looks like it they have a particular kind of you know they have a particular vibe of person they kind of go for maybe shot is only one that sort of like breaks a mold because she's kind of a bit you know she has that kind of a uh, dirty hipster look but for the most part everyone's quite attractive you know if you put them a bit do them do them up with a bit of makeup put them in some um some fancy clothes and it looks stunning on a night out so for her to beat the odds and be that person because i'm sure there's a lot of former models trying to you know get some do the whole dj griff for her to kind of do it and actually have it as a career you know is to be commended so for her to then sit at home for six months and not do the thing that you love the thing that you've that's given you an identity the thing that's kind of given you hope the thing that's allowed you to travel the world it can be difficult so when a promotion like position comes up and says hey do you want to play for us um you know during this time and you feel like you can maybe um give people an escape because that's what's happened too because i think there's a lot of i saw a story the other day about disneyland paris sorry disneyland um florida i think and people in america were kind of bemused as to why anyone will go to disneyland um during the pandemic right and a lot of people that they were interviewing were basically saying that hey this is legitimately prior to covid or prior to the pandemic disneyland was their kind of escape from the kind of craziness that's going on in the world the chance to kind of unwind to unplug and to kind of reminisce about a time when it, things were far simpler when you were younger right like you're kind of seeing all these old um disney cartoons popping up all over the place lots of different characters that you remember you obviously have the experience of connecting with your child or with a child you're taking there it's a really from what i've read and reading the the article it made a lot more sense to me why someone would go now i wouldn't go in my position but i understand why i need to so i think a lot of those people that are partying now they kind of feel the same and especially young people who have been effectively because that's the thing you think about it. imagine if you graduated this year right like legitimately your career prospects are looking on the up you had some things sorted out you kind of had some internships lined up and then now this happens right there's a, there is a kind of point there is probably something in you that's just like you know what i just need the time to just unwind and just let loose and forget about how crappy my life is going to be for the next what five years maybe two if you're lucky right especially off the back end of dealing with this pandemic so i understand the 
desire for so young people to be like, look, I don't want to be at home constantly reminded about the horrors that are happening in the world. I want to just enjoy myself for one night. So maybe that's something that they can do. But I think it's probably irresponsible for me to be posting them on a profile page. Probably that's not the best thing. But, you know, we live in a narcissistic world at the moment where if you have social media and you're doing something like this with that kind of crowd, you have to post it in it because you feel like if you don't post it, it didn't happen. Um, but then there's also a part of me that thinks a lot of the stick that she's getting for this is a tad unwarranted because there were a lot of other people that played at this thing right um there was what the guy called um had one there was um a shlomo dude played as well i think i've got a video here from them right playing is a clip of some guy here with a face shield which i actually have I've actually worn mine but this is my face shield see I need to actually get that on there, right? My little fake shield, but there's yeah, so a lot of other people were playing, but she seems to be getting all the hate online for some reason. I guess people don't like her. It's a video. Morning, like my prick. See a dog. You look fake. Morning, like my prick. See a dog. You look fake. Morning, Robbie. No need to breathe. Now you're worried. You should leave from my. Bloody miss a good rave and then yeah some other dude playing again see it wasn't only her really all the way to the morning god damn it it looks like thunder to be fair doesn't it so yeah wasn't only her look at that crowd imagine if you imagine if you hear about the spike star oh how bad will you feel and then lastly there's her playing there standing ovation it was that clapping yeah but yeah it wasn't only her man do you know what I mean there's loads of other people and I think there was a what there was a rave they did last was it last week a couple of weeks ago I'm gonna say and I funnily enough I think I actually mentioned here my notes funnily enough a lot of the people that were playing in their previous parties were mostly female too mostly women women um which is interesting because I would I'm really interested to see what the reception would have been like if it happened to be Marco Carolla, Adam Bayer, um, Chris Liebling, all these sort of like, you know, um dusty white dudes in techno that everyone seems to hate. Imagine uh, Richie Horton and stuff. No, Richie Horton's a legend, I don't know, I just never call him Dusty, but you know, that kind of crew, Mateus Caden, um, you know, Mateus Tanzem. Imagine if those kind of guys were playing. <sighs> the the ritual they would have got because they were the people already think they're taking up room in the scene and they should allow other people in other voices so imagine what they would have said with that right um this is actually had one talking about it here saying oh my god what a blast that back-to-back -back surprise is viper diva with my partner in crime shlomo tampion was crazy you can also check amelie lens enjoying our set and the third video thank you my possession family in paris hope you do this soon again so <laughs> Seems fun. Being cool, smoking behind the decks with a cigarette and stuff, having you know, doing the thing. And then the other people that played, this lady called Ani and Antia. She was vibing last weekend, yeah, or a couple of weeks ago. No one said nothing. And then you got another lady called Felice, Felici, Felici. And then again, looks good picture, though, doesn't it? And then you've got who else is that? Oh, Ellen Alien played. But don't you again? This is only for the videos, right? Don't get me wrong. This and then the lastly. VT, VTS smashing it but is it me or don't you feel like the videos are a little bit the people in them there's a little bit of hesitation a little bit of trepidation a little bit of um, uncertainty in the air people aren't going as crazy as they probably should if they're in a rave 
So that part of me thinks, imagine how much better these parties will be once everything is sorted and settled down. I, you know, I'm itching to go out, right? I'm I'm the person that will travel, you know, to random places at Burkhine on my own just to go see my favorite people play, you know, go to random nights all over the UK to go see people play that I love. Um, listen to mixes, you know, for seven hours in a row and stuff. I'm I gagging to go out, don't get me wrong, but there's a part of me that thinks it's going to be far better experience when things settle down and people are actually feel a lot more safer in that kind of environment. The release and the jubilation that you will have in that environment is going to be out of this world, out of this world. Just imagine, just imagine what that's going to be like once everything's settled down. So I don't know. I think in conclusion, if people want to go, if, 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 if the country that the promoters are in have deemed it to be safe enough to host these events and they're, actively asking the promoters to put them on so that they can um, boost the economy and provide jobs and also provide a welcome relief to this horrid situation we're going for cool if it's dj especially if you're Emily lens i guess it's you know it, it, it kind of paints you in the wrong light because she is somebody that is quite vocal about animal cruelty and veganism and stuff so for her to be so conscientious about the health, welfare of animals but then be so dismissive about the impact that it could have by put but the impact that she could have by playing at a packed party like that you know there's a little bit of hypocrisy there but i guess we all have a bit of hypocrisy within us and i guess for the people that aren't fans of it and don't want to go and think it's all ridiculous you know just stay at home innit, and let the people do their thing what we what can we do really i think what's proven especially with the pandemic is like no amount of shaming no amount of shouting no amount of lecturing people who don't think it's that serious who don't think it's as it's as serious as you think it is is ever going to change their mind we've seen too many videos of people getting into arguments fisty cuffs you know people have been stabbed over this sort of stuff right ran over um it doesn't work that way they're never going to listen to you berating them they're not going to listen to you in general because they made up their mind that they would rather go out and party with their friends than staying at home because they just want to do that there's no rhyme or reason why they're doing that they just prefer to do that i think it's okay let adults make their own decisions and i think if you're not a fan of it then you just stay indoors and advise your friends not to do so and make sure you keep your family and friends safe really i think that's the best way to go about things i don't think we're ever gonna convince the crowd that want to go out at all costs you know, like i said before i think if you want to break your if you want to if the first rave you want to go to is go see Amelia lens then you know we have to question your taste in music to begin with <clears throat> And also we have to just be respectful that you might be a legit fan of hers. You might be her diehard. You might be the person that's actually keeping her lights on, which is great, right? And I'm sure she's very thankful for seeing her fans up close and personal, especially if she's legitimately spent all that time alone. But I've always been suspicious. I've always think I'm aware or I'm kind of, I've got knowledge of there's been a, people have been going out regularly anyway in general in places you know and just keeping it storm and not posting on social but the people that are obsessed with kind of the image they're obsessed with letting everybody know where they play they're obsessed with doing that post that everyone's doing at the moment oh it's six months before playing do you know what I mean oh it's been we all know how long no one's been out do you know what I mean like no need to keep telling us and reminding us but hey what do I know man what do I know let me know your comments down below let me know what you think did a me lens fuck up by going to play in paris what our possession um the party collective our data blame um it, did they do anything wrong to begin with would you go to it if you were in the city let me know in the comments down below i'd love to know your thoughts <clears throat> so what else we have on this here what else we can actually get some liquid fiber we got some things about we'll save the michael baby one for later mm. Oh, I just want to. <clears throat> so this is one. Um, yeah, let's talk about this one. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I made a like hypothetical thing, little note that I made about the, how, what I would do if I want, <laughs> what I would, um, not what I would do, but I tried to make a hypothetical document about how you would approach defending Brian Callan, right? Um, against the allegations that have been levied against him last week of sexual misconduct against, you know, 
some instances that span what 20 years or something right um some people that have some very detailed accounts as to how it happened and how it went about and he's obviously firm he's kind of come out and denied this allegation and said the category didn't happen but i was wondering because it seems like you know socials kind of split in terms of what they believe i'm also a big believer in you know um due process i think he should be given his day in court i think just accusing somebody of something shouldn't mean they're guilty but i'm also kind of aware of the idea oh i'm also kind of a naive believer in that i don't think a woman will just kind of blindly come out and say you raped them just for clout or just for exposure i think that's a kind of a heavy crime to levy upon somebody i think it's a heavy allegation i think it's a smudge that you can't ever kind of get off it's a cloud that you can't ever outrun so i think people are society is kind of conscious about knowing when to kind of label somebody a rapist and when not to label somebody a rapist so i kind of kind of outlined that but then it also made me think because someone left a comment in the other video talking about what happened with um what happened with chris hardwick and what happened with aziz ansari and i saw this pretty interesting article pretty in-depth article from forbes magazine that basically talks about that issue at length right and kind of lays out exactly what happened and kind of paints a really um dire picture as to um the ill effects or the consequences sometimes of false allegations and the damage that that has, had, that has done to some respects to the me too movement which i honestly at the, even before i read the harvey weinstein book by um what's the guy's name the son of woody allen or the kind of supposed son of Woody. no he's the son of woody allen isn't he what's his name i've got it somewhere here but anyway when i read that book doesn't matter um about the harvey weinstein case even before i read that i did think at the beginning the me too movement was a uh, net positive because i guess you know especially when you read when you watch a lot of crime documentaries and you see instances where women have unfortunately been raped in home invasions or <clears throat> by serial rapists whatever it may be you find out how crappy and how horrendous the experience no how crappy the police are with dealing with it and how horrendous of experience it is for the women in question to kind of relive that horror and you know try and get the person convicted of the crime that they were subjected to it's just an entirely horrible experience so to see this me too movement rise up which kind of in a weird way the only way they could kind of retribution the only retribution they could get from it or kind of revenge was to was to kind of counsel the person publicly shame them i'm all game for it if you can't if you can't convict the person in court you know the least that you can do is take away everything they've worked for because you know they've essentially ruined your life uh through um whatever action they did in the past but this article sort of paints a different picture as sometimes the um uh, the shadow side says so he exploring the shadow side of me too this is from uh forbes magazine it's from uh when is it last year by a lady called stephanie sarkis it says the following newton's law uh, newton's third law of physics states that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction in the area of me too women have come forward detailing harassment and assault by men many times by the men in a position of power there have been cases where a man accused harassment and abuse states that he either did not engage in the behavior or that he was dismayed to find out that the partner reported the encounters as non-consensual sometimes documentation accompanies these statements in some cases a company has kept an alleged uh, perpetrator in the position or reinstated him after an internal investigation how does this impact all parties involved it says appalling an article in new york in the new yorker details and that al franken original accuser lynn tweedy was connected with the media outlets that made that had a political interest in pushing forward her account which is you know dubious to say the least franken resigned from senate after a story of her photo surface where franken is shown either groping or pretending to grope tweedy's breast while she was asleep after performing a skit at a uso event it should be noted that seven other women come forward alleging inappropriate behavior by franken but let's talk about these cases with a great areas cases without the known political agenda yeah that was an interesting one in it because i think at the time they were propping up al franken to be the next kind of you know um democratic candidate and then suddenly this picture comes out of him kind of pretending to grab a woman's breast and then some people try to defend it say it was a joke and then boom seven other stories come out so it feels like whenever these stories do come out the allegations there's always a bit of a maybe it's not so malicious because it does seem malicious it does seem like whenever someone gets accused there's never just one accusation it's usually followed by a bevy of them so if either it's the journalist trying to do their due diligence and make sure that the person has um <clears throat> has a history of that kind of behavior and it's not a one-off thing or it's the industry and somebody higher up deciding hey it's time for this person to be taken off their perch we don't know so it says here on june june 14 2018 chloe Dirstra, chloe dijkstra 
wrote an article alleging that she had been in an abusive relationship which she wrote included sexual abuse and emotional abuse she gave details on the relationship but did not name her former partner however it became clear that actually was referring to the nerdist founder and talking dead host chris hardwick this is the really egregious one because i remember the time she never actually said his name in public i think not until much later she purposely kind of wanted to avoid it whether because she knew her story had a lot of holes in it or because she didn't want to relive the horror and kind of say his name out loud but it was interesting that he kind of got suspended or put on leave or upon garden leave from his job without even being named right it was just kind of alluded and that was enough like they kind of panicked but again that was at the height of me too <clears throat> it says here mc suspended cardwick appearance as a host of talking dead and nbc suspended his appearance as a host of the wall while they reviewed the accusations legendary entertainment who owns nerdist removed hardwick's name from their website after the allegation surfaced they released a statement dis distancing themselves from hardwick said chris hardwick had no uh, operational involvement with the nerd these statements are always funny because they always try and distance you from whatever you were doing so that no one else comes after them and say that it's an institutional thing so they say chris hardwick had no operational involvement with the nerdist for two years preceding his expiration of the contract december 2017 he no longer has any affiliation with legendary networks legendary digital network sorry the company has removed all reference to mr hardwick even as the original founder of nerdist pending further investigation <coughs> sorry got a frog in my throat it says um Another one from the war says there are very serious allegations. Oh, him, he says that she's a, he's quote, there are very serious allegations, which is kind of similar to Callan actually, and must be taken lightly, which is why I've taken the day to consider how to respond. I was heartbroken to read Chloe's post. Our free relationship was not perfect. We were ultimately not a good match and argued and even shouted at each other, but I loved her and I did my best to uplift and support her as a partner and companion in any way and at no time that sexually assault her. So the interesting part of it is that obviously once the story kind of rolled on, we kind of came to the, no, once more of the story was revealed, it was actually the fact that she had cheated on chris hardwick that was the issue he immediately broke up with her she went she then spiraled because you know you're in love you do crazy things kept texting him harassing him he wouldn't reply back he wouldn't respond he didn't want to meet up with her didn't know nothing to do with her and then in that kind of anger she decided to put out a story that she was mentally and um, emotionally and physically abusive which you know it's completely out of order but um once more the story came out you kind of saw oh so you cheated on the guy that's why he went mad so that was probably why she didn't want to say his name and also him as a gentleman he didn't even mention it in his statement he didn't say anything about the cheating he just kind of tried to keep it classy um, which obviously worked in the long run but you sometimes feel like if you are defending yourself you kind of have to go on the offensive and really go for the next of people and it says here Cardo released a screenshot for the text with Dirkstra Hardwick stated that the, while he was living with Dirkstra he discovered she was unfaithful to him resulting in him ending the relationship he stated that Dirkstra had asked him to several weeks to reconcile but he declined due to cheating some responded that it is not unusual for a victim to abuse to pursue reconciliation um after internal review amc and nbc and legendary entertainment all three of the big ones how was reinstated in all three corporations he says we take these matters very seriously and are given the information available to us every uh, very carefully review including interviews with numerous individuals who believe returning chris to work is the appropriate step so he saw that story with chris go down and then the other one is the most egregious one, which is an anonymous woman named Grace, who we still don't know who she is at the moment, the Zee Ansari thing, gave an account accusing Zee Ansari of sexual assault after meeting him at a party and going back to his apartment. Screenshots of a text between Grace and Aziz and Ansari, sorry, um, Ansari, 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 was posted along with a link with the article. Ansari allegedly, allegedly texts the accuser and says that it was nice meeting her. The accuser responds with a freak paragraph text, including, We went back to your place, you ignored clear non verbal cues, you kept going with advances, you had known uh, you had to know i was uncomfortable which is insane in it right i don't think in the heat of trying to get laid any guy is going to really be able to um um be able to clock non-verbal um cues that you're not comfortable i guess most women if they're not comfortable situation the ones I've, I've dealt with they will tell you quite clearly hey get get off me leave me alone i don't want to do this then you back when you go home right um you know you work on you work on porn hub and you you, you know do your thing and go to bed that's it well, what else can you do right you've been rejected it is what it is and um, you took up to the game but these non-verbal cues at the height of us trying to or at the height of this kind of sexual encounter is insane at the time but hey you know and then disease takes it back i'm so sad to hear that i'm so sad to hear this sorry all i can say is it would never be my intention to make you feel um the way you described clearly i misread things in a moment and i'm truly sorry 
and it says here it was true that everything that did seem okay so when i heard that it was not the case for her i was surprised and concerned i took her words to heart and responded privately i was taking the time to press what she said i continue to support the movement that is happening in our culture is necessary and longer for you so that goes to show you that sometimes you know all the allegations you hear sometimes you should always try and hear the other side of the story of course right in that respect so it kind of got me thinking about how you would defend Callan in this situation and I guess um, we should kind of go back to the point of we should make the accusation of great great I keep saying great we should make the rape ad accusation a big deal you shouldn't just be able to accuse somebody of rape and it be okay no you shouldn't be able to just, just accuse somebody of rape willy-nilly right we should um return the severity of the crime to the actual word the actual phrase right it shouldn't be just something you throw around willy-nilly it should be hey if the did the person actually rape you did they try and forcefully um you know touch your private parts in any kind of way without your permission yes okay rape if it was a clumsy sexual encounter they read the rogonic signals that is not rape we need to kind of get back to that point so if there's occasions that are a bit gray or that are a bit ambiguous we can kind of talk about it as adults so because you're throwing the rape label or attaching it to any kind of encounter that some people don't like or some people didn't read the right way it kind of messes up it messes up for everybody because the real issue at hand here is that actual real victims of rape have now their voices have somewhat dulled or they are probably a little bit more conscious or wary about stepping out especially if they see somebody getting a negative reaction right imagine if these women who because callan get completely rinsed online if you're a legit victim of uh, rape you're not going to be able you're not going to be willing to step back out there because you're thinking raw if they don't believe these women right with their story that seemed kind of credible and i've got an actually legit one imagine what they're going to do to me so that's one um uh, obviously i said here sexual i think regrettable sexual encounters aren't rape we should never do that i think we've all been in encounters i think we've all kissed or slept with people that we didn't want to or that we didn't really enjoy their company or that we kind of regretted the day after right that is the where essentially the walk of shame comes from right the walk of shame is the fact that you've not that you've stayed up all night doing lines of coke with some stranger the fact that the walk of shame is usually because you've been shacked up with somebody you probably shouldn't be shacked up with right Right? and you're trying to get back home without society noticing that you've clearly been out for 24 hours right um i think that's okay right that that's part of kind of growing up that's part of actually finding out who's for you and who isn't for you by fumbling a little bit and hooking up with people they shouldn't be hooking up with and then when you do end up with somebody that actually lines up with your ideals and what you're about suddenly everything starts to make sense suddenly all those past relationships suddenly start to look a lot worse <laughs> um here again i said Said, um although there needs to be an open judgment free conversation about men and women and how we caught each other that's probably not going to happen though in it really i don't think we're really ready for that conversation about what actual courtship is like what actually trying to hook up with somebody actually looks like especially if you write it on paper it's fripping nuts right you need to really think about how you hook up with a girl or how you hook up with a guy and it's really really nasty in com especially when you compare them to the standards on social media or the standards with people that are you know um uh, what socially active or work whatever it's not it doesn't line up correctly but we need to get there pardon says yeah um but it's uh the most con oh yeah and i've read here i read here but i guess in uh in kind of opposition to that the other thing that's concerning is that i remember being at a house party ages ago and you know you get talking everyone's high and drunk and stuff in the living room and people are kind of sharing stories and i remember someone brought up a story i don't know why about you know some sexual assault thing and then i remember you know people chipping in everyone chipping in especially the girls there and i was like hold on a minute i was like what can what has every girl in here had some kind of experience that they would kind of classify as sexual assault and they said yeah so a couple of them even said they've been legitimately raped i was like what the hell so that was kind of really took me aback. i was like jesus christ so most young women have kind of had that situation happen to them which is abhorrent to say the least isn't it right so with that you're kind of especially for me you're i'm kind of prone i'm kind of always you know the part of me is kind of i, I kind of want to believe them when they say when they say something's happened because 
most women have had that experience of had something close to that or know somebody close to them has gone through it so i don't think there's many that would purposely go out again there is a small minority of people cases that you do hear somebody screaming rape it didn't happen the guy goes into prison for 26 years there are those horrendous stories out there right but they're the kind of nightmarish ones i think mostly most people most sensible most decent people wouldn't necessarily want to put someone through it if they didn't wouldn't want to put an innocent guy through something like that if they didn't actually f legitimately think that happened I don't think so. So if the if one, two, three, four, five, six people come out and say that about you, there has to be some validity to it. There has to be. Now again, we're talking about rape. We're not talking about you know the stuff that happened with Delia, where he's supposed to be trying to court younger girls because that's a very complex issue about you know society not being prepared about the conversation about you know um, women, young women's desire to hook up with older dude, older dudes desire to hook up with younger girls. We're not really you know ready for that conversation at the moment. But I'm talking about straight up people violating somebody, right? um you know trying to um you know gain sexual advances or trying to get yeah, trying to be sexual with somebody who clearly doesn't want it that's the issue at hand here and for every girl out there to have some story that they can kind of you know talk about that happened to them personally or somebody they know that's really distressing um and then there's also to end there i think to if you want to defend him you'd say maybe defending brian Callan, you'd say <sighs> In future, more women, if they do get raped, should just call the police to file a police report at, at the least. Again, I've, re I've watched enough documentaries. I've seen enough programs, which again, it's not actually going through the experience, but I've seen a lot of stuff that obviously tells you that the process or the way that um, rapes are dealt with and with the police departments are it's horrendous, right? And I can't even talk about how it is in America, but in the UK, it's just terrible. Um, you know, how you get violated with rape kits and stuff, the questioning, it's just, you know, they have to do their jobs, but it's not a pleasant experience. But I think there should be more onus placed on, there should be more importance placed on women when they go through something like that to guard who the person is, even if it's a close friend, it's somebody you know at work, you don't ruin their life, they've got a wife and kids, you have to report to the police, you just have to. Um, just so that even if it even if it doesn't go in you with the police and you do end up coming out again and to saying it in public, you have documentation and a record that shows you did take it to the highest levels of authority, but they did a poor job in dealing with it, right? So it kind of gives you a story. I won't say legitimacy, but it does kind of put your story in some kind of context you're not trying to do it for the clout i don't know um i guess that's how you would defend him with it that sound good defending him i'm not too sure but then i also stumbled upon this video that kind of describes probably kind of gives a because it kind of made me think about amy schumer's post and what might happen in the situation where brian callen is vindicated and it's shown that he was innocent of the crimes and he didn't do what the ladies are alleging him that he did do and i was thinking what would amy Schumer do with that post that she put up right where she essentially went at callen added him said hey you're a creep la 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 what would she do um but then it also got me thinking why does she hate callen so much right and then i stumbled on this video from the fire and the kid <laughs> where they essentially rip into uh amy schumer and considering how small the comedy circle is and considering how people it feels like especially someone like Bert he does it a lot Bert Crash he always tiptoes around Amy Schumer and doesn't really say nothing bad about her because I'm assuming she's a big Hollywood celebrity and also doesn't want to you know add to the pylon because people don't like her and I think she still has jokes but he, it seems like everyone in the industry is very careful about what they say about her right even someone like a Rogan doesn't want to say that she still has jokes for instance right which you know you'd think he would be um, more willing to do so considering his experience with Carlos Mencia but this video might give you an insight into why Schumer has that kind of time for Callan and why she sort of hates him. This is from The Fire and the Kid. I think what episode, I don't know what episode it is. Load up on the screen. Should load up before. I'm poorly prepared as per usual. Let it load and I'll tell you what number it is. I get to get the time sample as well. That is at 3 minutes 47. Let me Can load. we revisit the Amy Schumer incident? Yeah, there yeah. you go. I, so we got I, some shit for So I guess this episode was off the back of that incident that happened with Amy Schumer when she went to the comedy club of some guy that was doing his um headlining show and she interrupted it mid set. I got some so so I got some, let me let me say let's start by no, this. I just let got some new information. Let me defend yeah. both so Yeah she interrupted the show mid set and essentially t told the guy that she wants to do her her minutes which is not etiquette in comedy. I guess the etiquette is that you let the person do their time and then if you want to go on after before somebody else closes, you can do that, but you don't interrupt somebody mid-set. I mean, that's not what you do. But I thought this kind of beautifully kind of uh, is an example of maybe why Mishima kind of hates these guys because I think they were the only people who kind of went in at her apart from Legion of Skank Stooge, which I don't think she's ever going to kind of bump into. But let me see if I can get up on it. This is three minutes 47. Let's scroll across here. 
Da, 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 get up on the screen again. Where's it? 347. It's around here, and it? Not here. There you go. Yeah. You know the grind? And, and by the way, can I just say something about Amy Schumer's stand-up comedy? All due respect, she's not, she's, she's not great. I, I, I... That's why she hates him. <laughs> that, that's all it takes. That's all it takes. Just that one sentence. She's not great. People that, I don't think people actually say this out loud about their fellow comedians. It's not something that people do for the most part. I think they sort of allude to people that they don't like and stuff, but they don't ever go out ham and say, hey, she's not great at what she does. I have many, many friends who are, are funnier. <laughs> See? That's Amy, why she doesn't Amy's, like it. Amy's good. And Amy has earned her place in Amy's, her movie, Trainwreck, she's doing great. But it's not like Amy Schumer is a great comic genius. I don't, I, I'm, I get a kick out of this. There's a comic who's been doing this so long. I just get a kick out of, popularity doesn't mean that you're really funny. I know a lot of women that I'll put. That's interesting, him sitting next to Brandon Schaub and saying something like that, isn't it, eh? But hey. Put up against Amy Schumer. I'll put their hour up against Amy Schumer in a heartbeat. I can give you a number of them. So it's not oh, like. Just off the top of and then also, if anything comes out about Shaw, don't be surprised if she posts something about him because look what she did. Look what he did. <laughs> like Schlesinger, a, yeah. Winnie Cummings. There are a lot of women that'll hold their own and men oh. way better. So, which I don't like to get into this comparison stuff. But no, because it's everyone's flavor. Everybody's like, different. But let, let's not get let's not also get it twisted. Ain't no. Oh, Kellen. Oh, 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 That's why she hates him. Oh, oh, brutal man. Don't get me wrong. He's probably right in what he said, but. As a comedian to comedian, professional to professional, you just can't go on your show trashing me like that, innit? So when she saw that story pop up about him, she was probably like, oh, oh, I'm going to eat very well tonight. <laughs> so she posted it, but God bless them, man. Um, yeah, <laughs> I guess that's why Amy Schumer hates Brian Gallagher. It's not going to change. Oh, I stumbled upon it. That was a good one. But yeah, anyway, what can you do? What can you do? So that's been the Excellent English Show episode number what, 351. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. It's been a pleasure to have your company. As always, if you're watching this via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below with any questions, thoughts on the show, that'd be much appreciated. If you want to follow me on social media, do that too. My name is Agostino Zinga, all one word. You find me on Instagram, find me on Twitter. You'll be able to find links of my socials in the description down below. And if you want to support the show via Patreon, make sure you do that with a link below to patreon.com for just Agostino. Subscribe as little as $1 and you get this full podcast you probably listen to now ahead of time if you're one of the backers you've listened to this full in full audio before anybody else on patreon down below click that link down below and get on it until then see you guys very soon take care be safe wear your mask stay away from a media lens <laughs> i'll see you next time peace